Hi, and welcome to AGL Live. I'm Elizabeth Raley. I'm in the working group of AGL, and we'll kick us off today by telling you a little bit more about our, our organization. AGL is a nonprofit org that provides agile resources, information, and community to those working for or with government. We have a lot of resources on our site, including agile trainings and videos from past discussions with some of government's finest agile champions. You can find out more about us, contact us, or sign up for our newsletter on our website agilegovleaders.org. Today we're going to be discussing DevSecOps with a very experienced panel who will be moderated by Ben Morris and we invite the audience to post questions in the Zoom chat channel anytime during the talk and now I'm going to pass to Ben to continue introductions and then we'll launch into the panel discussion. Thank you. Um, I think this is a discussion that is exciting or at least I'm excited about it so I look forward to it and and I was hoping that we could actually dive right in to getting some perspectives from the panel um, and have everyone answer this first question in their own way. Um, and just before they do that, very quickly introduce themselves. Um, and so the first question that I'll toss around to everybody is that our industry really loves buzzwords. Um, and buzzwords often have a, a habit of becoming ill-defined buzzwords. And so how would each of you define DevSecOps in 30 seconds or less. Um, and so I'd love to start with Paula to get her perspective. Sure, so uh, thanks and well, uh, welcome for everyone who's joining us. Um, so my name is Paula Thrasher and I work with uh, GDIT and we're obviously a large uh, federal integrator and I work in our national security group and I do a lot with both Dev and, uh, and lately Ops and so I've been in the sort of DevOps space, if you will, when I sort of discovered that in the 2010 timeframe. Um, my definition of DevSecOps is it's really when security is an equal partner in the, the culture, automation, lean management, and metrics, you know, the calm of DevOps. Perfect, and ni nice and very much within 30 seconds, I think. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, all right, so let's um, pass it over to Christine to get her intro and perspective. Hi, I'm Christine Schmeckel, and I work for the State of California and Health and Human Services Agency. Sorry, you're not seeing a video, but hey, I work for the government. I can't figure it out. So um, I um, am the uh, health and the uh, uh, um, agency security officer uh, managing and supporting uh, the information security officers for all of agencies. So we're talking um, multiple departments from um, uh, healthcare, mental health, public health, uh, which accounts to about 30% of our population here in the state of California. So lots of sensitive data. So that's about me. And, uh, and, and what we do here. So for a, a definition of DevSecOps, I, I actually, uh, I don't, I mean, I think there's a lot of definitions out there. So for me, I'm gonna tell you what I want it to be. And that's, I want it to be ubiquitous and accessible. I'm, I mean, it meaning, I'd like this term to not have to be standing out as a, a marketing item, shall we say. So we need to connect development with program. So. Um, when I, as an example, ask for a description of what a code can do, having the documentation within the code is not necessarily helpful. We need to be able to communicate to program and to business. So there we go. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and next I will um, ask Ben to introduce himself and answer the question. Thank you, Ben. Uh, let's see. My name is Ben LeBalm and uh, I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for Civic Actions. We provide digital services for government agencies and the public sector. I've been online since 1976 when I first logged into the ARPANET at MIT. And that was really easy to do because anybody could walk up to any terminal and create their own account, no passwords needed, and you'd have the same rights as everybody else. Uh, things have changed a bit since then. Uh, anyway, a few years ago, Civic Actions received a DOD contract that required a security officer, and I was the last person to step backward. So here I am. Uh, DevSecOps helps with the process of what I try to do every day. 
as it involves breaking down the silos between developers, operations, and security requ requirements. Basically, what I think of is while DevOps has embraced infrastructure as code, I see DevSecOps as embracing security as code. There's a shift left concept that brings security and auditing tools into the development pipeline. And while on the production side, we're looking at real-time evidence collection, verification, and continuous authorization is the pot at the end of the rainbow. Great, excellent. Um, and then I believe Mike uh, is due next. Great. Well, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Mike Hermes. Um, I am um, I run a, a boutique next generation technology advisory firm called uh, Revolution Four Group. But the reason people usually invite me to talks like this is I was very recently the chief technology officer at Department of Homeland Security uh, for almost three years, and so uh, that was uh, that's quite an experience. Um, I define DevSecOps, and it is, I was wondering if we were going to get cookie cutter definitions or if it was going to it was going to be a varied as it, as it has been here. I define DevSecOps as the uh, application of technology, uh, process change, and cultural change to, to more tightly integrate uh, and apply automation to security within the development and deployment process. Um, so I think that you know everything everyone said here fits right into that. Uh, I, used, I used to really talk about primarily automation as the, as the real value in, in kind of creating deterministic outcomes for security and, and development pipeline. But I do think those cultural um, changes are very important as well. Excellent. Um, and last but not least is Greg. Hi, my name is Greg Ellen, and I used to be um, a government employee at the Federal Communication Commission and um, often ran into the wall of cybersecurity compliance and had all of the opinions about security people uh, and their lineage um, when I was more in the development perspective. But I have since left the government and I'm the CEO of a company called GovReady and we are focused on automating and accelerating the assessment and uh, authority to operate process uh, and compliance. So I, I, I do like the um, some of the definitions that are online for DevSecOps, uh, and I love the idea of thinking of it as a set of practices, uh, and a set of practices that are focused around um, reducing the time between when you make a change in a system and when you deploy that change out into the real world, uh, and being able to deploy that change with, um, with high quality and high confidence that it will be work, that it will work, and I think the SEC is that it will work and it will be um, trustworthy. Excellent. So I guess uh, I guess all the answers were right. I, I was I was tempted to maybe like try to pick a pick a winner or something, but uh, but I think that those are all good perspectives. Um, so I think to to dive in and kick off the discussion, um, you know, just kind of dive into the heart of it, which is that security is a topic that very rightly people take seriously. And when we take something seriously, especially in government, we often tend to, um, uh, you know, seriousness means process and it means conservatism and it means a, reluctant, a reluctance to change process or practice. Um, and in the security world that might actually make us less secure than more secure. So does anyone have good examples or case studies where that sort of conservative conservatism has actually been counterproductive and caused harm instead of benefit to the organization and to the mission? Um, I think it, it, I'll just give a very quick kind of um, general example, which is that uh, the, the conservative nature of security organizations leads it to be very slow to adopt modern and emerging technology in general. And in many cases, modern platforms, technology tools actually radically increase the security posture of a system or an organization. Uh, and so that conservative, um, uh, you know, that conservative desire to slow that progress actually is counterproductive to the security posture of the organization. Yeah, I want to add that I think um, I think there's a mindset mindset shift that 
has happened and it's happened unevenly, which is that security is not about the paperwork and the, in the government space, the ATO or the, you know, the list of NIST controls. It's actually about the actual real security that is in place in your system and the threats and vulnerabilities and the risk you're dealing with. Um, I guess my example of that is at one point, so a lot of what I do in my group is we're working on um, infrastructure automations that span, we run three enormous, actually we run more than three norms, but we run a tremendous number of data centers. I think we actually calculated, we manage 2.5 billion um, assets just among those three contracts. Um, so it's phenomenal in scale. And the team was challenged, okay, autom help automate your security process because our DevOps teams are going faster and you're not keeping pace. And they came back with, okay, we, we met for a week and we have an idea. We're gonna make the paperwork go faster. We're gonna build a workflow for the paperwork. And I went, you're missing the point. It's not about making the paper go faster. It's about actually automating the security controls. And when I suggested that, I mean, their eyes got kind of big as saucers and they were like, we need to go back. <laughs> you know, back to the drawing board. I just think that mentality, the natural reaction in the security community has been to document, document, document. It's been very risk centric about mitigating your risk. And it, it hasn't, I think, quite pivoted to where some of the agile and DevOps has gone. We have projects who are releasing to production. I have projects that are releasing to production daily and the security team shows up once a week on Thursday. Those aren't in line. That's, you know, so those, are, I think that's some of the challenges pivoting from this risk approach to sort of actually really proactively securing things. I'm, I'm going to jump in. I agree very much with Paula and Mike's example, but Fen and I have a couple of, um, of, of very tan, we have a couple of small but very tangible examples. Uh, and, and Fen will probably have to help me, but there was a case in which we were we had set up the servers to require um, keys to log in um, were and and the way that we had set up login we didn't use a user password but as paula was saying there was a paperwork requirement a security control where you had to end a user session after a certain amount of time you had to force no you had to force the change of the passwords after a certain amount of time but we didn't have passwords at all so we were using multi-factor authentication and, and keys, and we didn't have passwords. So we actually had to turn a feature on in the computer in order to demonstrate that we had set a feature that we had turned off, we had to turn back on in order to demonstrate that we had the security control in place. And I think that there are weird little things like that that routinely happen. Um, and they have the effect of not only risk of not keeping up, as Mike was saying, with the new technologies, but they also have impact that they create discouragement in the minds of some of the teams about doing security in general, because they've been they've been asked to do something which appears to be silly. Yeah, I'll just jump on that and say, um, Paula. First of all, I, I, I wish I love that what you were saying, and I, I want more people in the government to hear that um, uh, because we are seem to be continuously uh, being able to demonstrate through automated verification of systems that they're secure, but unless we produce a ream of uh, Word documentation to, hand, th to throw over the wall, um, then we're not compliant, which is kind of crazy. And, and going, going more back to the question um, that you asked Ben, uh, and another example that, that uh, Greg might have alluded to, the security has traditionally been very conservative. The FISMA is written back in 2002 when your when your life cycle, your, your development life cycle was like 18 months. And you could, you could be conservative. You could actually make sure your system was really secure before you handed it off to people. But that's really hurting right now because, well, we've got development life cycles in, in the minutes or seconds. And, and, uh, and the, the black hat hackers are not waiting 18 months before they come out with their new hack um and there's just little things like like dod laptops until there's a good number of dod laptops out there that are still running sha1 certificates which were deprecated years ago and all of our systems have been off of them for years but 
that's still secure because it was defined secure and it's very hard to move that definition forward. Now they're, 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 and they're now I think 80% upgraded, but I mean, it was like 2005 when they were just considered to be, to be bad. And they've only started working on it for about, I think July of last year. So, so it's just too, way too slow. Yeah, that's great. And, and uh, you know, we've, we've kind of talked about, we've been going around on sort of the, you know, the problems or, or airing of grievances a little bit with that question, which I kind of invited um, in fairness. So, um, so I would like, you know, just for everyone's sanity and, and morale um, of anyone listening or participating to shift over more to the promise side for a little bit. Um, so, you know, that promise, I think a lot of it is to, to move faster, right? Um, so how can, how can we move faster and be as secure or more secure? Um, which I think those of us here probably believe that that is a, um, that that's a valid path. So are there some specific concrete examples out there of, you know, even if it's small things where there are some of those win wins, like what, what are some of those concrete examples where we're doing something where the teams can move faster, they can deploy more often, and the code is much more secure. It's not doing that um, in spite of security concerns or, or ignoring them, but actually more embracing them and, and, uh, and bringing that in. So I think um, a great example of this, and actually Greg, you're well aware of this project that uh, we're working on at H HQ at DHS. And um, you know, we, we were uh, mandated to try to help the components and the component programs get to the cloud more effectively and leverage the cloud more efficiently. But we did was use that mandate uh, to say, look, getting to the cloud is great, but what we really want to do is get to the cloud while kind of enabling uh, a true DevSecOps tool chain environment, posture set of processes, et cetera, and automate as much of the security process as possible. And so what we did was we, we built a, a, a reference implementation of a set of tools that really did, um, uh, you know, we talked about infrastructure as code, well, actually did that in practice. Uh, Including looking at the entire supply chain uh, of the of the code, uh, as well, you know, open source tools included, um, and created safe signed images that we could use to deploy, uh, and then automated scans and the outputs of those scans and kept track of them. Actually, using a tool that Greg built as a part of the control documentation, uh, and we actually created a structure around all the controls that we could, uh, and so all of that comes together to create a environment where developers uh, can actually move more quickly, move things through the pipeline more quickly. But the security folks, when they looked at this, they, their minds exploded. Uh, they said, look, this is, we need all this stuff. It, it, now we're not just documenting the controls, but Paul's point, we're actually automating the controls. We're improving the outcomes of these controls. We're getting visibility and transparency on these, uh, these controls, and we're actually improving the security posture. So I think that it's not at full scale. You know, we still have a long ways to go with that, with that project. But you know, you could see the, the security people and developers both being happy, you know, with with the outcome of this project, and that's a great example. I mean, I just ask, is that the CDM project, the Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation? No, that's this is a project called uh, Cloud Factory that we did out of head, headquarters. CDM is out of MPPD, and that's really about bringing, um, you know, endpoint protection, network monitoring, um, a whole host of tools available off the CDM to large swaths of the federal government that didn't quite have it yet. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to sort of build on uh, Mike was saying, um, different customer actually. So one of the things that my team does, we've done um, 11 different tool chains now where we've come into an agency, didn't have a tool chain and help them, you know, from the ground up start it. And one in particular was wildly successful in adoption. Um, adoption rate was up to 87% in the first year, which was, I mean, if you can imagine 80% of your organization adopting anything, <laughs> that's huge. And it was so successful. It was so much more successful than the other versions that we were doing in terms of adoption. We were kind of like, what are they doing <laughs> that we need to repeat? Um, and what was interesting is a core element of what they brought into the tool chain was the security. And it was brought in very collaboratively. The security team was um, a very close collaborator on the development of the tool chain. They weren't just like, we'll consult you when we're done. They were actually actively engaged in what was created. 
and they they did in fact automate many of the controls. So it's you know it's a sort of standard DevOps tool chain in that um, you know it's got Git and it, it uses um, it uses ThoughtWorks Go instead of Jenkins, which a lot of people use, but it's, um, it's a nice product. Some other stuff it uses Chef to write the infrastructure as code. It uses um, Terraform to create the cloud images, um, but actually it also can work in the data center as well. So it's not only a cloud tool chain, it, it also met the customers that were in the data center. And that was important as well, reaching out to people that weren't maybe cloud ready yet, but could still adopt these practices. So um, the interesting piece, and it follows immutable infrastructure patterns and some other good DevOps ideas, but it also implemented some open scap and some other security automation. So somebody who adopts the tool chain inherits approximately 85% of the controls that they need. And the difference is all they have to do for their application, some unique application centric things. What that means is the average team that starts on that tool chain can have an ATO in three weeks. That is amazing for an organization where the ATO average prior to this tool chain was six months. And what I found interesting about it was because, well, and, and secondly, um, I said another interesting point is that it means that about 95% of the infrastructure is now reusable and repeatable and created through the tool chain and not what I call bespoke <laughs> servers where you built your own custom server. So that changes the attack surface as well because now we've got some standardization. What's interesting about it in terms of driving adoption to get both automation and, um, and speed and, and all of these things and, and better security, through is that by building this tool chain, they made it faster and easier for a team adopting it. So they got immediate ROI because it takes effort to automate things that you don't currently have automated. Your team has to spend time doing that, setting it up. But if you got a six month payback for three weeks worth of effort, in a heartbeat you would do that, which is exactly what happened, right? All the teams went, oh my gosh, I can save six months, I'm in. And that to me was a really interesting insight that when we, uh, when we actually have that ROI, the benefit that automation gives, it's appealing to teams who, yeah, they want it, they just don't have time. Great, and, um, and to kind of jump in there, um, I did want to, um, I did want to remind um, anyone listening, if you do want to use the chat feature within Zoom to to drop in a question for the panelists, then we can try to um, work those in as we have time. Um, and so I just wanted to interject quickly with that reminder. Um, and then um, now I'll, I'll pass it back off, see if there's any other panelists that want to chime in. If, if, uh, if Christine wants to chime in from kind of the, the uh, information security hat side, um, that's more than welcome or, uh, or others. Well, this is Christine. The the um, in the state of California, this is a very new development for us. So within Health and Human Services Agency, we are using some ad agile development processes, and uh, which Greg is familiar with. He's working over there right now, actually. Um, and it's uh, the win win is that that security is uh, more visible um, it, because we are. Our institutional or on, on institutional structure on all all sides. You talk procurement. You talk, um, you know, hiring staff. All of that are are um, not keeping up with this type of development. So the institutional knowledge and in, in the new way of of, of uh, developing is not within necessarily our, our civil service ranks because that's not how they were, you know, that's not how they were hired. It's not, it's not that, that they don't know how, how it works. So um, all I'm trying to say with that, as far as the win-win is that this is, this is uh, the model that we're using for a very um, um, important system within our health and welfare uh, system. And they are um, showing the rest of the organization and and the rest of government. So it's, it's taking at the, at, the, at the highest levels of the state of California, they're looking at how this development can work and how we do need to change our institutional operations on all, uh, in all areas. The, the challenge with um, bringing in lots of uh, experts, which would be the, the contractors who work in this mode, is again, keeping that institutional, institutional knowledge. So the small groups that are developing 
code are moving in and out? How do we keep that continuity and, and move it to the space where we can make it repetitive within other um, development operations? So, sorry, I was a little bit looped in there. Uh, no, that's perfect. And actually that, um, that kind of tees up nicely another topic um, that I want to talk about. So I have um, one prepared question, then as a heads up, we'll then go to um, a follow-up question from, uh, from the audience. Um, but, but you bring up this point of, you know, it's more than technology, like these win-wins. A lot of times we talk about, oh, there's this great tool, this great technology that, that does something um, that solves, solves both problems at once. But um, how much of this whole DevSecOps concept as defined by, um, you know, whoever, uh, as de defined by each person, uh, but it is not really technology and automation. Um, how much of it is just that, um, you know, the right people having the right conversations at the right time, um, and essentially the completely non-technical components of development? Well, I'm feeling that a lot right now. Um, uh, I, it sounds like there's a lot of really good open eye, uh, new thinking happening around us, unfortunately not happening in, with the uh, authorizing officials that I'm dealing with, <laughs> where there's a lot of uh, cultural friction and organizational friction. Even when I can convince the people that I have to hand my, my compliance documentation to, that, this is, that there's better ways to do it, they have to feed the documentation into uh, EMAS or CSAM, these big, big systems that expect only Word documents. Um, you can't even, I can't even hand them PDFs. Um, uh, and, and, then, and, then, and basically they're constrained by the law. The law requires things like FISMA and FISMA requires a, a certain way of doing things, a certain set of controls. And, and, and those controls were defined largely before the cloud existed, before the current, current systems that we have, building systems exist. Um, we need, we need uh, as long as the, uh, uh, the, the thinking, go, as long as the people who are required to stamp the system secure, have people above them that say, we have to obey the law as it's always been, we're not going to move forward. We're going to have insecure systems, and so it's really I'm, I'm really heartened to hear that, that there's there's movement happening, and, I, and I'm hoping it comes to my group soon. Yeah, you know the um, you hit on something that is very important, which is there's law and there's policy that comes from you know outside the a particular agency or what have you that they can't control directly, uh, but in most cases. So it's really the interpretation of that law, the interpretation of that policy that is the problem. And you know, in almost all cases, for example, with the, the FISMA controls, you know, folks can can accept risk. They can provide waivers. They can, uh, you know, satisfy the controls in 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 kind of creative ways. Let's call it. Um, uh, that's up to the authorizing official and the security team. They they have the ability to do that. So it's about the interpretation. But I would say when it comes to the divide between technology and kind of culture or people. Um, you know, it's in my experience in this realm, it's the people that ultimately control when we make these changes and the processes that have to be changed to make it to get to true DevSecOps. But it's the technology A that enables it and B that that and that changes people's minds when they see what's possible, when they have their eyes open to the technology and what it does for the security posture. It's that technology that enables them to start thinking differently and changing those processes and changing their mindsets. Paul said earlier. Yeah, I mentioned the uh, culture piece when I started off with my definition of DevSecOps, so to defend that a little bit. Um, I really think that, uh, I mean, tools are great. I love tools. I love automating. I'm the developer for a reason. Um, but I, as much of it is, you know, especially hard in the government, we, we tend to separate people into silos by contracts, and then <laughs> it's really siloed. But collaboration is a choice just because you're different contracts, just because you're different organizational groups, just because you report to different managers doesn't mean you can't get together for a daily meeting and meet. Um, and I think it's the fidelity of the communication that has an impact. So I really, especially in years of having come from the world of large software projects and large data center projects, um, 
I've, I've learned that, that how you structure the teams and how you communicate is really important and having cross collaboration and communication is essential. And, and that can be incredibly low tech. That can be showing up to a daily standup meeting for 15 minutes where security hears what the developers are working on. They hear what the CRs are going into production. They hear those things and they're involved and hopefully sharing back. Here's what the SOC is seeing. Here's what the actual adversaries are trying to do to your systems. So the developers aren't fighting fictional problems, they're fighting real problems. So I think there's an opportunity there to really, you don't have to go buy a bunch of tools in order to get DevSecOps. You can actually change it just by the way you collaborate as a team. And, and that sounds pretty consistent, I think, with, um, yeah, it's very much parallel to what you hear about, about DevOps in general, that it's very much a culture and communication concept as much as a set of tools um, and, and even with Agile, right? Agile software development is, is very much um, in line with that. So um, I did, as I mentioned, want to skip over um, to the audience question. I know, and Paula did put in some, some answer in there, so, um, but we'll let, um, I'll let you elaborate more um, if, if you um, if you would like. Um, sure. So the, the question from Jeff Marr is that the tool chain idea is awesome and sounds like it makes things easy for the organization. Uh, what challenges and tips do you have on maintaining and updating the tool chain itself um, in an iterative DevSecOps way? Sure. Um, so as I answered, we use DevOps to manage our DevOps tool chain. <laughs> That's part one. But um, let me actually elaborate what I mean by that. Um, so a tool chain is my word for um, a best of breed um, set of tools that you're using to automate your delivery pipeline, all the way from how you collect the ideas of the features you're going to implement in a given system for your customer, whether that be a user system or, you know, sort of a <laughs> under the ground system. Um, how you build your software, how you build your infrastructure, um, how you test, how you scan, uh, how you do performance testing, how you do security testing, all of those things compromise a tool chain. And uh, we have, we call it golden tool chains. So we've got a standard um, and that tool chain is what I'm talking about when I mentioned that we've, we've written it um, so that the servers are all um, Ansibleized. I don't know if that's a word, but um, they'll build themselves with Ansible. And then when we deploy a patch, it's through Ansible and everything. And then we, that also means we can treat it as a, like a flyway kit. So I have about three different customers that have taken that tool chain and put it on their own network enclave. And what they do is they pick it up and they put the Ansible script in their environment and then you change you know, IP addresses or whatever in the configuration files. And they're up and running usually in under 30 minutes. That doesn't give you a tool chain because your teams have to automate their build and they have to use it <laughs> and they have to connect the scanners and they have to, you know, just because the tool chain is there doesn't mean that a team's automatically using it. Um, but having that, um, having that gold standard, even though plenty of my more mature customers have adopted, you know, they've swapped out tools, they've picked fancier products, they're buying, you know, different things than the gold standard, which is mostly open source um, for different reasons, because they've got different technology stack or different requirements. That's fine. The fact that there's a default is huge. If you give your teams a, a good default, sensible default, uh, it's a huge way to change behavior. If the default is an easy to use tool chain, that's how it works. So um, we've used it as, as much automation as possible. And we have a pipeline we manage in JIRA of requirements. And when one of the teams that's using the tool chain gives us, hey, I want some more features around whatever, uh, we kind of vote on requirements and that's what we work on next. So making the easy thing to do the right thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's, that's exactly the approach that we took uh, at, at DHS with the Cloud Factory uh, project. In fact, s several of the tools you mentioned are the same tools that we use in our kind of default or golden uh, tool implementation. The, um, the reality is though, uh, and we do use DevOps. In fact, the, the first pipeline that the team built was the pipeline to manage their own development. Um, and and that's, you know, that's kind of the meta approach. Uh, but what, one thing that we also paid quite a bit of attention to is the reason that we decided to develop our own framework for the tool chain uh, was that we did not want to be locked into a particular uh, piece of that ecosystem, piece of that tool, uh, tool chain, so that at, at some point down the road, if there were a reason we needed to switch out for a different, you know, scripting uh, tool or a different key store management or a different scanning tool, um, you know, we could do that. You know, there's always going to be switching costs to do so. 
but we tried to make it as modular uh, framework as possible as we assembled this tool chain. Uh, and, and then we did, um, you know, little bitty analysis for each particular piece of that tool chain to figure out what was best for us right now. Um, but with an eye towards being able to swap those out as technology changes as, as our circumstances change. Um, great. And, and I think, you know, we're, we're just past the halfway point now and we haven't explicitly um, kind of attacked and I'm going a little bit tongue in cheek here, but we haven't explicitly attacked like the, the security folks yet. Right. We've kind of said that there's processes broken, but but there's sort of the stereotype out there. I think if you come from the development team side, if you're trying to ship features that, oh, there's these you know folks with the clipboards and they they just live to um, to, to say no. Right. They, ju they just want to stop projects and, and stop all the fun and stop us from from getting stuff done. Um, but obviously those those folks wearing the, the security hat um, have a valid reason to be uh, uh, to say no lots of times or to be inclined to say no. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of curious here from those who, um, you know, do or wear the, the CISO hat or the, the related, um, uh, uh, fill in that related kind of role is um, what, what really is that bottom line for, you know, letting you say yes, or that makes you want to say yes to pushing something through and putting your, um, you know, your, your reputation on the line or your organization's reputation on the line or, or what keeps you up at night um, that really is kind of behind those no's um, just to kind of build some of that empathy um, for the development teams to understand what those real concerns are. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this and then probably um, try to pass the ball gracefully to uh, Christine. Um, I've had an opportunity in the work that we've been doing to look at how to accelerate the process to talk to a lot of security people and, and kind of contemplate uh, their, that perspective. And I think that there are a couple of, there are a few key points. One is that what really troubles individuals that are responsible for risk or security individuals um, is unknown risk. Everybody pretty much accepts that nothing's perfect, but um, unknown risk is a complete wild card. And there's a temptation, uh, and so you can, a lot of the questioning and the hesitancy that might come from security is often, often comes up when the development teams or other people can't articulate what the risks is, what the risks are, they can't articulate what they've thought about and what they haven't thought about. And from a security perspective or from the organization perspective, you, you're not really looking at one system. You're looking at a hundred or a thousand systems. You have all of this surface. And every time we as developers deploy new functionality or deploy a new system, we are deploying new risk. There's a relationship between the new things we, we put into the field and the risk. If you don't know what that risk is, there's an unknown multiplier between the thing that you're putting in the field and the risk associated with it. And, and the inability, uh, and, and so that's a, that's a very significant concern. Um, I think the second one, I can be a little bit more brief, is that non-responsiveness is a real flag for secure people. If, if you're going to be um, battling a threat and you can think about the battlefield, you can think about a crisis where you're trying to rescue someone in a, from a helicopter, um, you want to know that you are going into battle with people who have your back and that they are going, and that they are, and so to some extent, you can think a lot of the assessment process and things that are painful is a little bit like boot camp because the security people want to know that they're that the that the that the people that they're going to have to work with the developers are ready to jump when needed and i think that that's another and and being able to show that you've measured the risk and that you can be responsive both go a long way into go a long way from making security people feel like they can manage the risks that may occur. And, I'll, and then I would pass it to Christine. 
Greg, I don't know what else I can say. I think you've, <laughs> you've done a very well, a great job of um, talking about it and, and trying to, as we all know, be a security officer that doesn't just show up as a big no on their forehead is um, something that we're continuing to work on. So when even in asking the questions to get the clarify, it goes back to culture and, and attitude. So when, when, the, when you're trying to get answers, but you're getting this, uh, I like the word non-responsiveness, is not helpful. So it could be a language thing, not asking the question how they understand it, whatever it is, but it does go back to how do we all work together. So in my real dream world is that, that everyone is, uh, has the same vernacular for security, um, no, no matter what level they're working at or what, what their expertise is. So we'd like to, I'd, lo I'd love to see this whole idea of having to have someone check stuff, you know, at, 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 other than, you know, yeah, we all need to have a higher level of, a, of somebody who's willing to say, yep, I get it, but not to have layers and layers. I, and, and nobody wants that in, in no matter what area you're working in. So back to the unknown risk, we're all going to have unknowns, but... Um, we need to be able to communicate it and understand how it's working between those different development groups. Because for everybody's out there working on their own, um, as you said, thousands of uh, different system projects working, and how do you how are those all going to roll up and tie together? Um, it needs to be articulated for for the more lay level. I'm going to use that word, I guess get out of security talk, get out of development talk. And that's about assurance. So it goes up to assurance to the leadership. Right. Yeah, I want to add to Greg's point about standardization. Um, this is a huge um, pet of mine. <laughs> I think it's really underappreciated. Uh, standardization is a tremendous security tool. Yeah. <laughs> it's very underused. And, and it's an interesting thing because I think some aspects of the real cultural transformation of DevOps for those that really embraced that aspect of it was that maintainability and operations requirements were development requirements and that development needs were operation requirements, that there was a the symbiotic relationship. So then I'm going to add the third, right? We're DevSecOps. That means security requirements are development requirements. And that sounds like, well, of course, that's always been true, but it's not. There's a lot of times where teams go, well, thank you very much. Here's my POAM list of security controls I should fix. They throw it over their shoulder. They ignore it. <laughs> and a more collaborative approach of, you know, helping, especially and sometimes it comes to the business. The business wants features, 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 and they don't want to spend the time to burn down the technical debt. But having a conversation, you know, developers sometimes, you know, we give them the security theater to fix when they say, you know, actually, if we fix this component, you'd get your standards, the ops team would have less work, and it would make my code a lot easier. Why don't we fix that first? You know, if you had a conversation, you probably can find the things in your system that are the top 10, everybody agrees, we should totally fix these things, and go work on that. Um, but I think it takes a commitment to standardization as a virtue that I don't think all teams have. Yeah. And I say, you know, I, I I'm not the security guy typically in the room. I, I, you know, know enough now to be very dangerous, but uh, I come at it from the development perspective, but I now have a, a strong appreciation for the security perspective. And I say anybody who, who doesn't believe that you need some degree of rigor and structure uh, and consistency around compliance for security has never tried to manage an organization, you know, that's fielding 100 systems every year, you know, or has, you know, widely divergent infrastructure and technology and tens and tens of thousands of people running around. Um, now, that's not true for all organizations, but there's lots that fall in that category. And even for the smaller organizations, there's a lot of benefit to those things. So I think you have to have a healthy, I think a part of the cultural changes, uh, just like with DevOps, is um, the a respect, understanding, and empathy for both sides of the equation, where the developers want to move faster and they want to deliver capabilities to the mission and to the user, and security guys want things to not be hacked and want to keep their jobs also, quite frankly, at the end of the day. Um, we talked about the unknowns, and I think that is unknown uh, risks are, are a real problem, and the, and the good security folks really do you know, focus on knowing the risks, making the right decisions relative to those risks, and then moving forward. 
Um, I think the ones that you know maybe aren't so good or have, have a ways to go are still focusing on the CYA aspect of it, which is just check those boxes and make sure that if something goes wrong, at least I can say that I did what I was supposed to do. At a certain level, that's a good starting point, but you, you need to evolve up the, up the value chain from there. And, and I think that's a lot of what, the, what this movement's about. I want to jump in on uh, a point that Mike just made. Um, there is a role for executives. There are a couple of very important roles for executives. And we're talking about the head of a government agency, the chief of staff, um, and not just the, the CIO, but also other people. And that is the executive of the agency needs to understand that only their team understands the risks to the mission, right? There's a temptation for the executive team to look at security and say that security is the subject matter and I need these subject matter experts. But the security experts can only do their work if the executives of the, of the organization are defining what the risks to the business are. And if they, and it, when executives fail to define that business risk, it forces the security people into the CYA mode that Mike was referring to, because they begin to see all risks as equal. And, and so there has to be, there's, there's an important role for leadership to say, we can tolerate this kind of problem, but we can't tolerate this other kind of problem. These are what are, you know, these are the organization's crown jewels. These other things are small change. And, and so it's, and, and that's, and I find that I'll, I, I, I put a lot of the blame at the heads of the agency for um, being wishy-washy about what is the security priorities for the organization. There, I said it, I went there, okay. Perfect. Um, and, you know, we've, um, we've talked a lot about, I think, what's interesting is that there's a lot of, uh, at least this, this group, it's, it's sort of encouraging, right? Like that I'm, I'm hearing lots of stories of like past progress, not like gripes about the present or just like, you know, um, uh, feeble hope for the future, but like actually lots of movement um, so I would imagine that there's at least some people in the audience and there's a, um, and this is kind of getting to also one of the, the questions in chat is, um, I think as we get into kind of the last 10 minutes here of the talk is let's focus on the future and giving ammunition to people out there. So there's change agents that are listening or, or maybe our, you know, nobody here has, um, that probably thinks their current environment's perfect. So. Um, so what ammunition can we give to those listening or to each other, as, be it um, the stories, the, the high level concepts, the, the low level anecdotes um, that convince the, those hardest, most resistant folks out there, most resistant to change that um, adopting this whole DevSecOps thing is, is in their interest. How do we, how do we kind of um, communicate that up the chain across the organization, et cetera. I guess I've stumped everyone with that one. No, no, I, uh, I can't stand silence, so I'll just, I'll jump in. Um, the uh, I think it ties back to a lot of things that we already touched on, which you know when, when you look at this from the security perspective, where I've seen them get most excited. So if, if you're, if I'm assuming that it's the security folks that are the ones that are hard to convince uh, in your in your question, where they get most excited is when they see um, what this what this new world can do for them and how it actually makes their jobs easier and makes, in fact, makes things more secure from their perspective. So, you know, Paula was talking earlier about, you know, inheriting 85% of the controls. When, when your security folks can see that you can hand a program or a development team 85% of the controls in a, in a consistent, high quality, repeatable, deterministic way, that those controls are implemented, implemented well, um, in some cases automated in their implementation, uh, that's great for the security team, right? That's great for the programs, it's great for the security team. So the, the convinced, the, I come back to my earlier assertion, which is that there's a ton of communication and culture and process change that goes into all of this. But at the end of the day, it's some of these, these foundational technologies, these, uh, these tools and, these, and how you apply them uh, that actually really make life better and make things more secure. And when you show that to the security people, I think they get excited by it. 
And I think once they realize, okay, well now to take advantage of that, to get that great goodness, I have to tweak some other things in my process or how we work together in order to get there. But it's, it's showing them what that, you know, what the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is. Uh, I think that gets them very excited. But you have to look at it from their perspective. Again, understanding and empathizing with what their concerns and their life is like um, to position that in the proper way. Well, we had a theme of uh, meta of using DevOps to do DevOps <laughs> and DevSecOps to do DevSecOps. So I'm going to keep going on that. Um, one advice that I give teams a lot in terms of transformation is we talk about, you know, I give the story of this team that did this amazing thing. What I always seem to leave out and people don't realize is you look at that team that's really successful and you're like, oh my gosh. And then you immediately want to go do a big bang. And I just want to do everything they just did. And that's not how they got there. How they got there was a series of small incremental improvements that they took over time. And then they did the amazing thing. So the most important thing I think you can do to transform is to not try to make this a big splashy project. I mean, that's great. If, if you've got an executive that wants to go all in DevSocks, you know, great, that's awesome. That, that's, go for it. <laughs> but I actually think some of the most successful transformations are the ones that are maybe a little more grassroots and a little more small incremental improvements. Don't implement static application scanning. There's a tool called FindSec Bugs. It's great. It's free. It's open source. If you've got a tool chain, you can plug it in really easily. Go buy, you know, uh, artifact framework uh, tool. Start scanning your frameworks. That's easy. Go find OpenSCAP. So there's, uh, for the NIST controls, the NIST SCAP, there's a community that's building um, automation around um, those controls. You can inherit somebody else's hard work. Those are just examples of things. You can do one thing. And, you know, invite the security people to your stand-up meeting, right? It's a series of small changes that you can make, and then I think you can make a transformation. It doesn't have to be a big bang um, that takes some executive level, you know, pronouncement of, of our buzzword. I'm, I'm going to make the recommendation, and I think um, it's from learning the hard way. Uh, don't tell other people how to do their job. You know, ask people, ask people what their, ask people what their job is rather than tell people what their job, how they should be doing their job. And, and I think that that creates, uh, that creates a lot of empathy and, and then the opportunity to uh, try other people's jobs yourself, right? You know, as, as Paula was suggesting, you can go get tools and you can try to incorporate them in your tool chain and you can try to do a scan yourself or try to do a code analysis yourself. Um, and, and I think that that creates, that creates empathy and it creates common language uh, when, you, when you walk a mile in someone else's moccasins. Um, and, uh, and, that's a, and I think that that's a very, uh, a very useful strategy to, to kick off things. Any other hard won lessons out there or just or just simple advice and our, uh, I think we might have time for one or two uh, more building, comments. Building on the tools, uh, the, the, the tool chains that people have been talking about here, like Cloud Factory and uh, I forget the one that you're using, Paula, um, the, the, is, is really the right way. I mean, there, there's, so, there's so much you can do to stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, there, there's, I mean, just starting off with a FedRAMP certified cloud is, is a huge start. And, and uh, use, then you can use something like uh, Rails 7 and Open SCAP, and, and, and that gets you another huge step forward. It's, it's really easy to move forward very quickly and then to look at the little pieces. How do I tie this together? Uh, I, I really feel like, you know, there is the, the, the hardest question is risk assessment, the unknown, finding out the unknown risk. But fortunately, we now live at a time where we have uh, where we can do 85% of our risk and uh, manage automatically. And, and that really allows us to take our time and look at that less, less 15% and find out what do we, what is, well, we'll never know completely what the unknown is because that's unknown, but, but where are, where is our risk and what, what are our possibility? Where, where do we have to focus our attention? Because we can, we're, our, we're getting to a spot where we, we can, just take right off the right off the open source shelf, right off a of GitHub, a lot of stuff that that uh, 
uh, will get us a lot of the way there. And uh, and I'll open it up for, uh, I think we've heard maybe, um, let, or we haven't heard from Christine in a little bit, so I, I'll give you the opportunity, but not the mandate, to have the, the last word on, on the topic of uh, what tips to give people who are looking to make changes in their org. Well, I think I've already, for, from my perspective, particularly because this is relatively new, at least in California state government, is a conversation. It's back to educating your folks. And, and that means at all levels in, in all um, lines of expertise and business that, that uh, it's not about bringing, for me, it's not about bringing your security folks over. It is certainly working side by side. And I, I will admit that that's a challenge in state government because um, security is um, limited as far as um, uh, capacity and resource. Um, so it might be in a small department, you know, like two, three people. Um, and, and a large department might be larger, but it is just, it's just scales to about that anyway. <laughs> so it is about talking to, uh, just continuing to, to include security in the conversation uh, outside of what you're, you're head down working on and, and keep that going. So that's about all I have to say. Well, perfect. Um, I, you know, I'll, I'll pass it back over to um, Elizabeth to kind of close everything out. But before I do, I just wanted to say thanks. I mean, this has certainly educated me quite a bit. Um, and I think it's been um, a, a, a great discussion. I think lots of both high level lessons and some low level practical tips. Um, and I even direct uh, people to the, the Zoom chat where Paul is even like getting really tactical and, and dropping a couple of links to tools and resources out there. So um, so thanks everyone. Um, and I'll uh, pass it off to Elizabeth. Yes, thank you to our panel and our audience. Um, we love the audience participation, so thanks for your questions. And um, invite everyone to check out this video once we post it on agilegovleaders.com backslash, or maybe it's, yeah, uh, live. We'll post it there. And thanks again. Take care, everyone. See you next time.